Hello, my name's Simon James. I teach in the philosophy department at Durham University, and I work on environmental philosophy. So I consider the philosophical implications of issues such as biodiversity loss, global heating, rewilding, those sorts of things. And it's environmental philosophy that I'd like to talk about today. I'd like to begin with a nice big question. Why conserve nature? Why should we conserve all of those, you know, habitats uh, such as rainforests or prairies, mangroves that are threatened? Why should we make any effort to conserve all of those endangered species of plant, fungus and animal? Why should we conserve nature? Economists and policymakers and many other environmental thinkers tend to give the same answer. If you speak to representatives from the uh, United Nations Environment Programme or the World Wide Fund for Nature or the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, if you speak to representatives from any of those organisations, nearly all the talk is about ecosystem services. The assumption is that we should conserve nature because of all the valuable ecosystem services it provides for us humans. Right, because it provides us with food and fuel, because it protects us from floods, because it purifies our water and pollinates our crops, because it absorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide and in that manner helps to mitigate the effects of global heating. So this is incredibly influential and prominent approach, an incredibly influential and prominent answer to the question, why should we conserve nature? Let's call it the ecosystem services approach. Now, as will soon become evident, I'm not particularly fond of the ecosystem services approach. Nonetheless, I concede that the approach has its uses. In many cases, environmental thinkers have successfully conserved nature by opening people's eyes to the valuable ecosystem services it provides for us humans. In many cases, they have in effect said, don't bulldoze that forest, don't drain that wetland, right? Don't dam that river, don't destroy nature, because by doing so, you are depriving us of valuable ecosystem services. They've said that, the right people have listened, and nature has been conserved. Great. Now, for some people, the ecosystem services approach is not simply useful, it's revolutionary. I remember a few years back, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales described the advent of the ecosystem services approach as, and I quote, one of the most important conceptual shifts in history. Now that strikes me as being completely wrong, right? For reasons I'll try to explain in a moment, the ecosystem services approach isn't revolutionary at all. In fact, I think it isn't a very good approach to nature conservation. More precisely, it has two major shortcomings. Now, the first major shortcoming of the ecosystem services approach is that it can't capture all the ways that nature contributes to human well-being. Or to put the point another way, in those cases in which nature really does benefit us, in many of those cases in which nature really does contribute to human well-being, it does so in ways that can't be captured in talk of service provision. Here's why. Talk of service provision implies the possibility of alternative service providers. So for example, um, our family boiler is serviced at great expense, I should add, is serviced by British Gas. But to say that British Gas is a service provider is to imply that there are alternative service providers. I don't know, Corgi or Scottish Power or whatever. So if you're talking about service provision, you imply the existence or at least the possibility of alternative service providers. But when it comes to nature, when it comes to natural entities, there are often no alternative service providers. Here's an example. For various complicated reasons, which I don't have time to go into here, there have been various attempts to oust Navajo Native Americans from a site in Arizona called Big Mountain, which they regard as ancestral land. 
One of the most famous Navajo activists was a woman called Catherine Smith, who passed away in 2017. Now, in response to um, demands that she quit Big Mountain, she told Senate investigators, and I quote, I will never leave the land, this sacred place. The land is part of me, and I will one day be part of the land. All that has meaning is here. Striking words. It's clear that it benefited Catherine Smith. It's clear that it contributed to her well-being, but it didn't do so as a service provider. For as we've seen, talk of service providers implies the possibility of alternative service providers. And in this case, there were no alternative service providers. Big Mountain, that area of northern Arizona, contributed to um, Catherine Smith's well-being, but it didn't do so by providing certain services which could, in principle, have been provided by some other thing. No, it contributed to her well-being because it was the particular place that it was. And because she valued it as the particular place that it was. For Catherine Smith, no other place would do. There are no alternative service providers. And this strikes me as being the case more generally. In many cases, when natural entities, such as woods or glaciers or lakes or whatever, when natural entities contribute to human well-being, they do so as the particular entities they are, not as the providers of certain generic services. So that's the first major problem, as I see it, with the ecosystem services approach. It can't capture all the ways that natural entities contribute to human well-being. The second major problem with the ecosystem services approach is that it is, or at least that it encourages a narrowly human-centered or anthropocentric view. Because to talk about the ecosystem services that nature provides is to talk about the ecosystem services it provides for us humans. It's to talk, to put the point crudely, about what we humans can get out of nature. And that kind of anthropocentric talk, contrary to what His Royal Highness suggested, is not revolutionary at all, given our overwhelmingly human-centered intellectual heritage. It is unrevolutionary. And not just this, it strikes me that to suppose that we should conserve nature merely because of what it can provide for us humans indicates a kind of moral short-sightedness. It seems to indicate a lack of what the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch once called moral vision. On the contrary, it seems to me that natural entities, all those lakes and mangroves and the various living beings that inhabit them, it seems to be that natural entities are often valuable for their own sakes and not merely for the sake of us humans. It seems to me that such entities often have what philosophers often call intrinsic value. I've argued that the incredibly popular ecosystem services approach has two major shortcomings. First, it can't capture all the ways that nature contributes to human well-being. Second, in its exclusive focus on human well-being, it indicates a morally pernicious anthropocentrism or human-centeredness. So, what's the answer then? Why, why conserve nature? Well, it's too big a question to try to answer in the, you know, the 30 seconds or so I have remaining. But what I would suggest is that any satisfactory answer to that question must be at once more humane and less human-centered than the ecosystem services approach. On the one hand, when we're thinking about why we should conserve nature, we shouldn't restrict ourselves to thinking in terms of service provision. We shouldn't restrict ourselves to thinking in that blandly managerial and one-sidedly instrumentalist way. On the other hand, when we're thinking about why we should conserve nature, we shouldn't assume that we should only conserve those parts of nature that are good for us, that contribute to our well-being. We should avoid that sort of human-centeredness. So for that reason, I think that any satisfactory answer to the question, why should we conserve nature, must be at once more humane and less 
human-centered than the ecosystem services approach. And it's just such an approach that I'm trying to develop in my own work. Thank you.